Again, it's so much fun up here every Saturday morning, a live radio show. Squeezing in. Squeezing in on the teeniest of stages uh, at this moment. Thank God we're all thin up here. But yeah, it's a good thing we're all oh, yeah. really, really svelte. Um, we are uh, happy to have just had Tom Tresser up here answering questions about what a city is for and some other provocative things. So that was the start of that conversation. We will have Tim back to... Tom back to uh, to talk to us more about that. Right now, we're going into the musical portion and the cultural and artistic portion of the show, and we have Tim. Thank you guys for having me. Tim Martin, Martin. Out, out the box records. Thank you for eliminating the the. It's out the box. Yes. It's out the box. Yeah. Of. yeah. None of that of stuff. All and right. Tell us a little bit about that label. Well, we started about 11 years ago based on uh, Chicago Blues Reunion and. Uh, Corky Sam, I was the ex-bass player of Harvey Mandel, and the, the origin of this movie started back in the late 70s when Harvey would say things, and he's a man of few words, and he'd say like, you know, I played with Buddy Guy a hundred times when I was 16. And I'm going, no way. <laughs> <laughs> so as I got to meet Corky and um, Barry Goldberg, Sam Lay, and these, these stories started coming out through friendship, I thought, there's a movie here. And were you already a movie maker? <laughs> no. I, I, I'm see, one and done. I love that. <laughs> yeah. And for all those aspiring movie makers out there, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> not the normal encouraging message we like. I like being I'm not the mentoring stage. here at all. <laughs> you know, you get involved in a, a project that you're passionate about, and you have no clue how much money it takes, how much time it Tell takes. Tell us. <laughs> all the doors that close on you all the time. You know, people are saying, oh, I, I'm passionate about the project, but I'm too busy. But, you know, the, the whole world turned for me. Corky did try to warn me. I'm a poor listener. Ask my mom. But um, the whole world changed when Elliot Roberts, who's the legendary manager of Neil Young since day one, got involved with the project through a friendship of Barry Goldberg. And then Marshall Chess signed in. Nice. And then all those people that would not take my phone calls all started calling me. <laughs> How cool is that? <laughs> now, when was this? How you long ago? You mean there's ago? connections Couple and all years? that stuff in a bit. music, not just in politics? Hard to believe, isn't it? <laughs> but uh, we started this movie five years ago. We did a low budget in 2005, very low budget um, um, documentary, sort of about this story, but more of live performances. And then um, in 2008, we did a all-star show at the Park West with special guests, and that was the origin of this, of this film here. How long is the movie? It's 87 minutes. Um, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to open premiere in uh, somewhere not in Chicago. Well, actually, we're playing in two weeks. It's a screening at the, uh, in New York at the Lincoln Center. Oh, nice. Yeah. So we hit big time. Now, wait finally. a minute. Didn't, uh, what, what happened at the Vic Theater a few weeks back? Was well, that we just the concert? That, or was, did you show the movie as well? We had a screening the day after at the Siskel at Film Siskel, Center. But right. that was kind of our all-star review with the band. And Shamika Copeland was there. And Elvin Bishop and Charlie Musselwhite, Quinn Sullivan. Ronnie and Lonnie Baker Brooks showed up. It was an amazing, amazing night. And for those listening, we actually are cutting a live album from that show. From, I, we had Quirky on just the week before it happened, so we were talking about it from this stage it's a, a number of ways. And uh, That's it's probably why so many people are going to see it. It's no incredibly doubt. strong. I mean, it, I, Eric Burden. Yeah, uh, how yeah. do I forget? Oh, one of and the, the animals. Pioneers the animals. of the 60s, yes. Yeah. The only non-Chicagoan. <laughs> well, tell me a little bit, before we uh, go back to the movie, I'd just like to know about your label and what kind of music you put well, up. Well, it's a heritage label, and for those who don't know what heritage means, it means, you know, legends, basically. People that we all grew up with, listening to on the radio. Uh, we have Dave Mason on there, Freddie Jones Band was on Whoa. there. Um, Chicago Blues Reunion, though, is my marquee band on that label. Yeah. And uh, can I ask how much it costs you to put this movie together? I cannot tell you that. Okay, because you don't know? I do know exactly. I don't want my children to know. Okay. 
<laughs> and what are your uh, what are the outlooks for distribution on this? Well, distribution is going well. We've got offers uh, out of Europe right now for both theatrical, which is going to be we we were very hopeful we get theatrical. You know, people in the United States won't go to a movie theater and pay for a story like this, even though it was grown out of the United States. But over in Europe and Asia, they eat this stuff alive. So we actually have some some offers on the table right now for international distribution as well as a theatrical release. Uh, do you have any uh, planned projects coming up besides uh, well, pushing this, this one? This is really a full-time job. You know, we have... Uh, we have to get this thing out. It's great to have this great film, but until it's a worldwide release, it, it, you know, the people need to see and hear this movie. Well, well I'm looking forward to it. Let's I'm take a short, you got a question, or we're going to no, take no, a little I break and get some, uh, get Sam just, Lay and Corky up here. Why don't we just have Corky come up and uh, okay. be a little uh, lackadaisical in terms of the musical yeah, thing. Here comes our friend and neighbor and uh, longtime eater here. Corky Siegel. Good morning, Corky. Hey, guys. Hey, Thank Corky. You. It's good to see you. Thanks for joining us, and thanks for bringing such a great crew of beautiful people here. Yeah, and before yeah. we get into anything else, I just wanted to plug this concert. Plug it. Plug Look it. out it's there at the up. world, Shed Fest, this amazing organization. Uh, I'll let someone else tell more about it, but it's actually starting on July 19th, and the Chicago Blues Reunion is performing on July 20th. It's in uh, Highland Park. And, uh, you know, we'll get some more information on that in a bit. But it's uh, going to be an amazing festival. I just wanted to throw that in. You're so soft-spoken today, dude. I'm sorry. Did, uh, did I, anyone hear what I said? I think the radio audience did. Did you eat tofu yet? Not quite. I will after okay. this. Okay. God I, love I've you. seen you more yeah. fired up when you're here. Corky <laughs> and Holly are uh, just uh, the best beloveds uh, of the heartland. We, we love having them here. And Holly, I just want to say you've done such a great job of keeping us aware of the wonderful things that Corky and other uh, illuminaries uh, have been involved with culturally and uh, you do a good job at that girl. Good, I hope good he pays there's not you more well. of them because it'd be like herding cats. <laughs> I'm well groomed. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, but for me and also I want to mention that Marcy, Marcy Lovey, Marcella Detroit is going to be joining us on the 20th. And, but the reason that I'm here today is because of Sam Lay. This is Sam Lay Day. Sam Lay Day. Woo! Sam All right. Lay Day. All right. Now, uh, of course, every day that I'm with Sam is Sam Lay Day. Of course. And there's a reason for that. Tell us. Okay, so we're talking about the blues. We got... Holland Wolf, the amazing, unbelievable, incredible Holland Wolf, and Muddy Waters, those guys were just amazing, and, and the way their music affected everything in the world, in every way. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, there was Willie Dixon who wrote the music and, and did arrangements. You know, the, so there were four guys, there were four guys in the blues that, you know, for me, were the power behind that whole thing. Mm. You know, when people fall in love with the Chicago blues and this and this. There's one other guy who is alive. Sam Lay. <laughs> who, who, you know, a lot of people may not know it, you know, but he was, you know, one of the major... Um, people in the blues that really created what we call the Chicago blues because you know he was on you know most of the chess record hits and he was in the studio with Willie and Wolf or Muddy and you know he would actually help define the arrangement and the, and the beat and the, and the rhythm so a lot of what we hear a lot of that is Sam Lay and people really don't know that and, and yet here he is alive and you know we love honoring our our, our legends mm -hmm. while they're still here it's a, it's a yeah, good idea to do that it's a wonderful that. thing to do you know and you know sam was holland wolf's drummer uh, muddy waters uh, little walters drummer uh, so he was around bob dylan's before first drummer. he got involved with paul butterfield and the butterfield blues band yes. sam was around before even sam was around because <laughs> i gotta say as a young <laughs> let that go michael let that let that go out there i well, like I that just a lot. remember i remember uh, probably it was the summer of 64 going to a place in Old Town called Big John's and uh, Butterfield would play there and I think uh, 
uh, Steve Miller Blues Band, those guys, he, he'd been up in Madison, he's out of Texas, and he would play there. And then, uh, I don't know, it was uh, probably a couple years later, but I used to go to a place down at 39th and Drexel called the Blue Flame. Yeah. And they used to have a platform that they put down between the back of the bar and the bar, and the band was up there. It was something else. Yeah. And I don't know if he was playing with them then or not, but uh, yeah. I, I listened to the, all those Butterfield Blues bands, the first one particularly, over yes. and over and over. <laughs> and and uh, Sam was actually my favorite guy. Yeah, uh, me too. And I, you know, I was there, and he was everyone's favorite. You know, we love Butterfield and Elvin Bishop and Jerome Arnold. But the band had this energy to it that was all Sam. It was this incredible drumming. And I know every harmonica player that has ever played with Sam has said the same thing. When you play with Sam Lay, and you, we played with a lot of drummers. I played with every blues drummer you could imagine, because when I played at Peppers, they had a different drummer for us every, every time we played. But when you play with Sam Lay, it changes the way you play, and you start doing stuff you never did before, because he's playing melodic drums he's playing this most am dynamic amazing kind of drumming that that has no limitations rhythm wise or anything it's all about the music it's all about the soul and the feel and he's not limited by groove you know he's moving with with the vocalist he's moving with the soloist makes us all like want to hear it it's amazing stuff amazing so sam lay he's still here yeah. He's still here. It's always Sam Lay Day when and I'm with Sam. still handsome as hell, I'd say. Don't you think? Yeah, yeah. Mrs. Lay? Quite the looker. Um, do, you, do you want to bring Should Sam bring up Sam now? Up? Yeah, let's bring yeah. Sam up. All right. We're come on up, Sam. Have come on, come Sam. Up. One more bite and come on up. A roast on to you, Sam. Keep it close, hon. Good morning. I've got a mouthful of food. We should have let you finish. <laughs> to, um, Michael? On your mind. Well, I'm, I'd like to know, uh, you know, I didn't, uh, clearly in, from the information I got up here from Tim and Corky, uh, I, uh, I didn't have a, a sense of your history. I just figured you were a young guy that had hung around with uh, Paul Butterfield and Mike Bloomfield. Uh, but tell us a little bit about how you got into music and how you got into drumming and pl even playing the guitar. Uh, no, you got that back, you got that backwards. Got it backwards. Bloomfield and Butterfield hung around with me. Right on. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> and uh, how, did how, did you, how did you meet those guys? Uh, working the south side. Uh, at, at, we need for that Blue to Flame. go up. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Working the Blue Flame uh, Lounge and Peppers on places on the south side. I met them there. Tell us a little bit about what you remember about the Blue Flame, because it's a, it's a place that I used to go to along with McKee Fitzhughes and the Sutherland Lounge, but uh, where I heard the blues early on was, was at the Blue Flame, and it was a pretty exciting place for a young white dude to show up. Tell us a little bit about the you place. You were a young white dude? I once upon a time, oh, yes, oh, okay. I was. <laughs> I just had to check. I'm still a white dude, but I'm not so young. Uh, uh, my my recollection, I live right down the street from the Blue Flame in walking distance. And uh, that was a place I used to go and listen to, you know, local bands and things. And uh, About how old were you when you went down there to listen to local bands? Were you in your 20s or younger? I, I, I might have been 20. Uh-huh. I might have been once upon a time anyway. <laughs> That's good. But Sam, and, uh, tell them who the local bands were. I didn't understand them. Who were the local bands? That you were listening to. Uh, mainly bands that I was in. You know, people like, uh, oh boy, I can't hardly remember now. Uh, Little Smoky Smothers and Jimmy Johnson. Quite a few of them I can't remember. Matter of fact, all of them, I, you know, Chicago musicians, West Side and South Side musicians together. Most of them from the South Side, but mainly Little Smoky Smothers. And you uh, grew up here in Chicago? Uh, uh, part, partly, and partly in, in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Aha. Well, two great Lake cities. They ought to put you into the Hall of Fame over there. 
<laughs> well, we'll see about that. I know they uh, got was, stuff was like it? my drumsticks is in that hall. Sticks are there. Yeah. What was it like for you as a young guy who then uh, hooked up with these uh, young uh, rock and roller blues guys uh, like Butterfield and Bloomfield, etc., and then traveled the country a little bit? and went other places. I mean, I remember seeing, I don't know if you were with him, but I remember seeing Paul Butterfield at the Fillmore out there in 64 or 5 out in San Francisco. I'm just wondering what's it like for a younger guy from Chicago to hit the road and, and uh, tour around and see some new places. Uh, well, it was, it was really kind of amazing to me because I wasn't used to traveling that much. And it was amazing to me. I enjoyed it quite a bit. And even thinking about it, I enjoy even thinking about it now, you know. <laughs> That's good. That's why Michael asked that question. <laughs> Picturing what the world was and opening, I mean, opening you up to the world. What, what maybe struck you the most, either as a musician or just as a citizen of the world? What, what hit you back then? I, 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 can't, I can't really explain it. It's, it's something I, I liked. I've always liked the music, especially blues, but I didn't know what the meaning of it. I know it was foot stomping. That's all I do know that, you know. <laughs> the old John Lee Hooker stuff. and uh, I, I don't know. I, it's, it's hard to explain. It's, it's, it's hard, it really hard to remember you know what made me start but I've always liked the music but you wouldn't believe it but mostly I'm into country and bluegrass music more than blues who do you listen to it. now Sam what's your favorite stuff of late <laughs> uh, <no. laughs> we're looking at the new album we from have, the movie Born in Chicago we have Tim Martin <laughs> holding up the, uh, the soundtrack of Chicago Blues Reunion this Buried like Alive in the, the Blues the Chicago Blues Reunion with yeah. the one of the bosses sitting right here by me Corky Siegel yeah. but uh, uh, <laughs> but my, my favorite was, was really all of those guys and it still is and and one name just wouldn't even start because yeah. like i say i'm into such a mixture of music i understand everything but rap <laughs> you would Ain't not be alone in that uh category if i can tell you about rap and explain rap i can take a horse and buggy and convert it to a 747 <laughs> That's as much as I know about <laughs> I don't know if you're catching all this, but we're having a good time up here. Let me ask, let me ask Corky a question, uh, and maybe Tim too. Um, what was it like for you younger guys who grew up in and around Chicago and then uh, starting to hit these clubs and meeting these guys? You're just going to have to wait to see the movie Born in Chicago. Once again, because we answered, we answered no, no teaser. We answered that question <laughs> in the movie. No, it. Uh, well, for me, you know, the thing is, the movie is a, you know, it started out as a story about these four white kids, you know. So we each have our individual stories too, you know. But the story in the movie really expanded uh, to become a lot of perspectives, a lot of stories about that era and that time. But for me, particularly. Uh, you know, I heard a Holland Wolf, a Muddy Waters album, fell in love, started learning a little bit about the music, met, met Jim Schwal, never read the back of the album cover, uh, and Jim and I were looking for places to play, and we're working our way up from the south side, from 800 South. We end up stumbling upon this place called Pepper Show Lounge that I knew nothing about. We auditioned, the two of us, they hired us, they hired a... Uh, what was that uh, like? uh, uh, 1965. They, yeah. they hi 40 for 43rd and Vincennes. Yeah. They, they were only two white kids in the place. They hi and I had been playing saxophone right up to that time, and playing in the black clubs on saxophone in the 60s, maybe even the late 50s. But uh, so here we walk into Peppers, and they hire a different drummer and different bass player every night. You know, from Wolfspan or Muddy's, and we're playing. And the first night, like Holland Wolf walks in, you know, I, you know, I, I just had his album. I never read the back of the cover, you know, and I tell the story in the movie about how every blues master that 
I ever heard of and many, many that I didn't hear of, started coming to sit in with us every Thursday night. You know, we play from nine till five in the morning. So it was like unbelievable, but you know, I was a little bit naive, a teeny bit naive, actually a lot naive. You think? Yeah, but then looking back young from- Young white guy, another yeah. guy who was white when he was young. Yeah, so far. <laughs> so I, you know, looking back on it, it's like the most amazing thing that anyone could imagine in, 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 in their life. Because, you know, my other buddies talk about going to sit in with Muddy or going to sit in with Wolf. They were coming to sit in. We were there on stage the whole night, and they were coming to sit in with us. Wow. And I didn't know what was going on. When you know did you meet I mean? Sam? I met Sam uh, in, I'd say, 19... 60, early 1966, he was playing with the Paul Butterfield Band. And uh, like I say, he was this amazing musical force that I never heard anything like it in my life, and I haven't heard anything like it since. Sam, you're known as a drummer, but uh, in this photograph, let's grab that photo, Katie, and we'll show it up so we can shoot it. Uh, it's got a great picture in an outfit that apparently you made yourself, I'm here. I didn't know you were, it's like New Orleans, you're making your outfit for the big parade, and you got this great outfit on, and there's no set of drums, there's a guitar. Look so, at my neck piece. Now, let me look at his neck piece. You know what that is, right? Talking to the mic. Oh, it's a, it's a rhinestone gun. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nine millimeter. Browning? No, honestly, it's a belt buckle. I punched holes in it and hung a chain in it and made a... And, and I, I made a, a neck piece out of it. It's actually a belt buckle. It's actually a what? A belt buckle. Belt buckle. <laughs> Made out of a 9 yeah, millimeter. Yeah, a natural street belt buckle. <laughs> I bought it at the flea market, and I punched a hole in it and put, hung a chain on it and made a neck piece. So, among other things, you're a fashion icon. An uh, accessorizer par excellence. I always say that Sam invented bling, and I'm dead serious when I see these rappers. Uh, Sam was doing this in the 60s. He was wearing the suits and the jewelry and the whole thing, and still I is. I still do. <laughs> I know. D and you mentioned New Orleans. Did you, did you spend a lot of time in New Orleans? In New Orleans? New Orleans? No, I, no, I played there. I did a festival there. Oh, okay. Michael mentioned. I'm sorry. <laughs> so what do you like playing more, the drums or the guitar? I, I like playing, uh, like trying to play guitar. It's really a hobby. But uh, all the old Delta music and traditional blues is not a one of them you can name that I can't play. And I learned on my own. Nobody taught me nothing. Sam Lay, do you uh, have any uh, words of wisdom to young drummers or young musicians in general? Yeah, save me some of your jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Save me some of your jobs. Yeah, I'm getting old and they're taking all my jobs away from me. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sam, that's going to change when this movie comes out. Don't worry. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. He said that's going to change when this movie comes out. Oh, okay. But see, that is one of the great things, Corky, Tim. Um, you are saving the... the um, Tradition. The traditions and, and the, uh, the long history that we are so... Uh, joyed, overjoyed to have here in Chicago, um, and I I appreciate that very much. Well, thank you. You know, the story is really a story that had to be told. Indeed. And um, when I'm talking to uh, Mark Levin, who did the Scorsese, you know, uh, fathers and grandfathers and sons, he he loved this film. And Marshall Chess says, "You're really the first people getting this story correct, That's factually, so, without the Hollywood twist." Doesn't that give you chills? Yeah. And you know, we did this thing. We made it. G-rated because I want this to be a timepiece that could be handed down literally for a hundred years so they know the origin of the electric Chicago blues and how that went across the pond and ended up becoming the Rolling Stones and Led Zeppelin and what is called rap today, Sam. I'm sorry, but it's the origin of that as well. Well, You started it, Sam. <laughs> you started I hope, rap, Sam. I hope that the, this album, the, the DVD and the CD all combined, you play it. If you hear it or see it and like it, I invite you please buy it. Now, if you play it and don't like it, I invite you to buy it anyway. I will. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're, we, you mentioned in rap, I just want to say there is a young rapper in Chicago that people should take note of, a guy named Chance. Chance the Rapper. He's getting some promotion, came out of Jones High School. He's a, he's a good kid. And uh, his music is really catching on. So I'm just calling everyone's attention to that. Um, 
Sam, do you do any rapping these days? No, no. <laughs> only thing I only thing I, I might have changed in the only last thing I months. rap is my lunch. <laughs> you wrap your lunch. <laughs> Before well, I forget, I want I to say one more time it. that um, there's going to be this event, Shed Fest, and uh, Eddie Clearwater is going to headline it. Uh, Big Bill Morganfield, who is Muddy Waters' kid, is uh, is going to play. Uh, the Chicago Blues reunion, a bunch of guys here, including Corky. Is uh, Sam going to play too? Sam's right. coming. Sam's coming. So it's going to be a great Marcy event. Marcy Levy. And Harvey it's Mandel. it's going to take place uh, July 20th. And it's uh, happening way up at the Shed. Highland, Highland Park. Highland Park. And Deerfield you can Road. go online to theshedfest.com and you can find a lot more information. It looks like it's both uh, Friday and Saturday. It is. Friday, July 20, uh, 19th and Saturday, July 20th. Okay. Actually, I don't know if I said it, but... Uh, <coughs> Big Bill Morganfield is scheduled to be on the show next Saturday here. So we hope that'll happen. And Katie, you will be interviewing him because I will be out of commission. Talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, either of you guys have a little more you want to share? Yes. Yeah. Here some info. Yeah, just another thing about Sam since this is Sam Lay Day. Sam Lay Day. Uh, there's this drummer named Steve Smith who's considered to be the greatest drummer in general. You know, jazz drummer and everything. He played with Journey and, you know, he's like this amazing guy. And he came to Chicago and he gave me a call. He says, I understand you know Sam Lay. <laughs> and I said, yeah. He said, I'd like to meet Sam Lay. Okay. So I, I brought him over to Sam's house. And he still says to this day, he said, you know, whatever Sam is doing on those drums, we, the schooled jazz drummers, need to know. We need to learn. We need to figure this out. We need to know what Sam Lee is doing, us drummers. Did you know that, Sam? I couldn't hear. I know you couldn't hell. hear. <laughs> yeah. It's better that he doesn't know. It's better that he doesn't know. <laughs> I've got one on that. That L train is. Talking about Sam Lay Day, uh, Steve Jordan, who's the drummer currently for John Mayer and Eric Clapton, plus a big time producer for guys like Keith Richards, came into town a couple months ago to do a record here in Chicago and found out that I knew Sam Lay and had Sam Lay's cell phone number and would I share that phone number with Sam. Okay, Steve Jordan, so. Wow. How about that for capping off Sam That's Lay Day? That's way cool. So make Sam Lay Day your day. <laughs> Sam, do you have any records where you're like the headliner on an album? Where it's a Sam Lay album? I got about eight of them. About eight of them. <laughs> yes. And what are the labels they're on? Oh, wow. Talk right into that microphone. Uh, uh, one is Appaloosa. Appaloosa like the horse? <laughs> yes. And, oh, wow. So, I, so they're I still can, out there. People can yes, find I them. Yes, I really can't remember all of them. But I got yeah, about Blue eight. Thumb eight. records. Sure. Blue Thumb. Yep. Blue mm -hmm. Thumb was one. Uh, is it a testament label? Testament is a label. That too, was yeah. the first one. And, Blue, uh, Blue thumb. That where's that out of here, or where's it from? Anybody it's know? from U somewhere in Europe, I think. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm gonna go uh, start digging on the internet as well as uh, through bins of old records and try to find your records, because uh, I think you're next to my. You are my favorite drummer. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Mine too. Thank you. Mine thank too. you. Thank all of you. I and mean, we want to thank you for being here and for your sharing thank your you gift. Thank you all for having me here. And sharing your gift all these years. Uh, thank you. Really special. Thank you very much. Thank you. The thank best you. thing you can say about a life well lived. You've shared your gift. Thank you. Michael, you want to tell us uh, a little more about next week? And, um, and then we're going we're gonna to think good thoughts. Because we didn't talk to him. I mean, directors well, are key guys. I actually, I met John Anderson at a Chicago Blues Reunion concert at Fitzgerald's back in 2005. And he just showed up as a fan. And, Is he uh, a noted director or something? He, I don't know much about he him. He did Brian side. Wilson's Smile. Uh -huh. So the answer is yes. Yes. Yeah. Grammy nominated. So uh, we started that project together in 2008. It's been subsequently finished up by John Bugue, who does the Crossroads Festivals, and um, we had to get the LA Power involved to go ahead and get this thing finished up strong and get some of the archival footage. The hardest thing on this film was, um, past the interviews, is just clearing every photograph, every clip of music, every clip that's shown on um, film. It's, uh, it's, it's a tremendous legal ramifications here for trying to get this stuff cleared. So 